Welcome to Discovering. Winter is a great time to be in the outdoors here in the UP. It ain't a bad time to be indoors either, especially if you like to tie flies. Winter is when I do most of my fly tying uh, on those really cold days. It's a good thing to do in the winter to keep your mind on the trout. And we'll talk with the DNR about a program designed to ensure that access to ice fishing opportunities is available in the UP. Sit back, put your feet up and relax. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields Call of the timber wolf the loon's lonesome trill Eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. four different types of flies. You've got your surface patterns, your dry flies, and they can imitate anything from a moth to a mayfly to a grasshopper, ant, beetle. They all float on top of the water. You've got your nymph, which imitates the nymphal stage of uh, mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, dragonflies, anything that lays its eggs in the water. You've got your streamers, which primarily imitate bait fish or it can be something called an attractor, which doesn't necessarily imitate anything in particular. It just looks alive. And you've got your wet flies, which can imitate small minnows or other things that swim in the water that isn't necessarily specific to a minnow like a streamer is. This is a leech pattern, a beadhead leech. Um, imitates leeches in the water. This is a variation of a classic fly called a Royal Coachman. I started tying it with a tinsel body years ago and added the synthetic wing to it. It's a small Adams dry fly. That is a grizzly dry fly. That is a stimulator pattern. This is what I started buying those curved hooks for. And this is a classic muddler minnow. Um, the head is deer hair and when you wind the thread around the deer hair, it flares out and you can trim it to that shape. Trout will respond to a lot of different things depending on the conditions, the time of year, the water temperature, how high or low the water is, but it all depends on the day and whatever's going on in the trout's mind. Sometimes they'll feed on the surface, sometimes they'll feed underwater. Sometimes if there's a specific dry fly hatching, they'll only hit that particular fly. Sometimes anything you throw out there, they'll slash at and have a good day fishing. There's a lot of good books. I started off reading books on fly tying. Um, there's a ton of them out there. Now with the internet, there's a lot of good YouTube videos on how to tie flies. I don't watch them so much anymore unless there's a particular new pattern I've heard about that I want to check out. But yeah, if you're interested in tying flies, definitely go to YouTube, it's your friend. get started tying flies, you need a vise. This, I think this is about a hundred dollar vise. I just upgraded. I had been using a twenty dollar vise for years, which was fine. This is nice because if I am doing something with a spun deer hair body, I can spin the fly around when I'm trimming it. Um, you can loosen that up. Most vices you can loosen up and turn this way. Not all vices let you spin the fly around a horizontal axis. You need a good pair of scissors, something with a fine point. Um, they do sell scissors specifically for tying flies. They're worth picking up. 
you need something to hold your thread. They're called bobbins. It keeps tension on it, but not too much, so you can pull thread out as you're tying when you need it, but it's not just all flying around loose. There's something called a hair stacker. I spent years not using one of these. One of my friends is a purist who very rarely uses anything other than dry flies. I'm more of a subsurface fisherman, so I'll use streamers and wets. But when you're tying dries, you want the tips of all the hackle to be at the same level. So you put it in that, wrap it a few times. When you pull it out, they're almost even. And you need a variety of hooks. This is a new type of hook I've been using. It's when you're fishing these, if you weight the head as you're bringing it in, it moves the body a little more through the water and makes it look a little more lifelike. What I tell people who have asked me how to get into fly tying is think about the patterns you're most likely to use and buy the materials you need for those patterns rather than buying a kit which will sell you a lot of things you don't need. Most fly patterns you're going to need, black thread is common, you're going to need some kind of hackle and the more expensive hackle tends to be really long. Chickens that have been bred and selected just for long hackles, you can make many winds around the hook. Cheaper hackle is going to be shorter like what I used, which is fine for wet flies. You can tie dry flies with them, it just takes more hackles. And they come in all kinds of different colors. Deer hair is common. When you tie with deer hair, it will flare. When the thread pinches it, it will flare all the way around 360 degrees and you can trim it off to a specific shape. And it's also very buoyant. It's useful for dry flies. Pheasant is one of the materials that trout seem to like. For whatever reason, the color or something in the feather is very attractive to trout. Peacock curl is another one that's very popular for trout. Something about the color or the combination of colors in that. Squirrel tail, which I used for tying this fly, is very popular. You can get different types of chenille, synthetic material for making bodies out of. There's a wide variety of dubbing, different colors to imitate different kinds of insects. Dubbing is the ultra fine under fur of animals like muskrat, mink, beaver, rabbit. They've also started making synthetic versions of it, which have more flash, which I like. Marabou is great for still water flies. It pulses in the water and provides a lot of lifelike action. Popular for flies like uh, leeches, dragonfly nymphs. You can imitate small gills on nymphs or just a pulsing, undulating body. The water will kind of slick it back, but it, it's fine enough it moves it all over. You can get flosses, fluorescent, natural. That's what you use to typically create bodies with. With a floss, it's bigger than you'd use for actually tying the fly. Styrofoam is common. You can get markers that will permanently color styrofoam. You can cut it out to make grasshopper bodies out of ant bodies. Rubber legs are popular, especially on bass flies or pike flies. Basically anything you can tie in a hook, you can use to tie a fly. It's a lot cheaper to do it, it's a lot more creative, and it's satisfying tying the fly that you catch the fish on. I would say I've tied in the thousands of flies. I tend to go in streaks. Winter is when I do most of my fly tying. Uh, on those really cold days. It's a good thing to do in the winter to keep your mind on the trout. I'm gonna make a variation of a classic brook trout fly called a picket pin. I like using different colors and different materials and sticking to the same general outline. Sometimes they work better, sometimes they don't. Using a bead head on it for a little extra weight to help get it down. And when you're tying your fly, the first thing you do is build a base of thread. It helps everything adhere to where it needs to be and not swivel around the hook. I'm using squirrel hair that's been dyed orange. And I may go with a different body than what you typically find. And when you're tying a fly, you 
going to try to keep the proportions even and keep any lumpy spots out. So when you're tying something like a tail in, you want to wrap it all the way forward so you don't have an abrupt ending where the tail gets cut off. I tied my first fly when I was probably six years old. I wanted to learn how to fly fish. My dad did it. He told me I was too young, too small to fly fish, so I thought I'd start tying flies and be ready. So I think I used blue jay feathers, some of my mom's red sewing thread, and a regular old Aberdeen hook. Tied a couple of them. I don't know if my dad ever used them. But we took a family trip out to Colorado the next summer and I used one of my flies out there in one of the mountain streams we stopped to fish at. And I caught a nice cutthroat, I think, on it. And that had me hooked on fly fishing, even though I was using a little Zebco spin cast, big swivel. I don't know what the trout was thinking, but I had fun. This is wax, it's called dubbing wax. You use it when you're, this is called dubbing. And you wrap it around the thread and it sticks because of the wax. And these are chicken feathers. High priced chickens. Not your typical meat stock or egg layers. So the hackle comes off the back of their necks and they breed chickens specifically for this for making flies. And you use them in a few different ways. I'm using it to add a little texture to the body to make the fly look a little more life lifelike in the water. Provides a little extra movement. Not all flies have this. Typically you'd use hackle more in dry flies. And it's what keeps them buoyant and above the water. Um, but in some flies, you can use them to add a little life under the water, look like legs or something moving. This is a variation of a classic pattern. Um, the classic pattern is kind of a bluish, greenish, blackish all through the body with a little bit of brown on it for the wing and the palmered hackle. I tend to tie a lot of my flies with some color variations. It's about anything you can imagine you can use for tying a fly if you can wrap it on a hook. A lot of the dubbing I use is synthetic, so it has a little extra shine to it. Dubbing is the ultra fine under fur of animals like muskrat, mink, beaver, rabbit. They've also started making synthetic versions of it, which have more flash, which I like. This particular fly has a big head on it. One of the popular trout food out there is a minnow called a sculpin, which has a really big head. I don't know that this fly was designed to mimic that or not, but some flies, some wet flies do have large heads and that might be the reason why. The hardest thing about tying flies is not called the whip finish. You take them, there's tools that most people use to do this. Um, you take and lay this piece flat Twist your hand around and wrap the loop over itself about six times. And add a little cement to it, keep it from coming undone. And there's the finished fly. It's a lot more red than typical, but I have hopes it'll work. I made myself a little drying rack. I put the flies up there until the glue dries and then they're ready to use. A lot of my flies are experiments. I know the basic patterns and I know what works up here, but a lot of the time I will try variations of them to make them better or worse. You know, only fishing with them will tell you which. Various local partners have volunteered to assist the DNR with a pilot program to keep boating access sites plowed this winter at more than two dozen popular Upper Peninsula ice fishing locations. 
I talked with DNR UP Field Deputy Stacy Hoy to get the details. This is something that we've been talking about for several years, and uh, I think what's really unique about about the challenge here is it's not really a, a something we can do statewide or even UP wide. Uh, getting access sites open for winter uh, is is really a case by case, site by site situation. So that's what we've been trying to do: is how can we partner? Um, whether it's a unit of government or a fishing group, an individual or a bait shop owner to keep those sites open for the winter. Um, Obviously, it's more of an issue in the upper peninsula than it is in the lower peninsula just because of our snowfall. So this is a great place to start the pilot project in the UP. So that's really what we did. And because those access sites are paid for by voters dollars, now we can't keep them open in the winter with that voting registration funding. So there really isn't a funding mechanism. And so really these are partnerships between the DNR and, and whether it's a local unit of government in some cases or a private individual or a bait shop where they're going to sign an agreement that they'll keep this open for the winter and they're doing it themselves. So um, this isn't a, um, a new challenge or, or something that other states aren't dealing with. It's the same situation in Wisconsin and Minnesota. So we're hoping with this pilot project, we can kind of get um, some partnerships going that would allow those access sites to stay open and get them more accessible for people to get out and recreate and, um, you know, be able to ice fish and just, you know, have more of an opportunity to connect with the resources. So that's really what we're doing here. We've put a lot of time and effort with our partners here to try to see if this is going to work. And, uh, you know, maybe there's some folks out there who might have an interest in, and also partnering to, to do something like this in, in their local area. So if you are interested, you have an access site in mind uh, that you'd like to see open for winter access, if you're part of an organization um, that might be interested in partnering with us or a unit of government, just give me a call uh, at the Marquette office at 226-1330. And, you know, we'd be happy to, to have that conversation or, or email. Um, you know, hopefully next year we'll have a few more uh, access sites that we can keep open and, uh, and get a few more people out uh, recreating. I also talked with Stacy about this year's increase in attention to outdoor-related activities. One thing that we've noticed is a, is a national trend is each year um, across the country, 2% of hunting and license sales are it's going, it's declining by that pretty much every year. Uh, but what we saw this year, kind of um, in with all the other things that were happening, a bright spot was uh, we really saw people connecting with the outdoors and getting out there more in record numbers. We saw a huge increase in first-time licensed buyers, uh, especially in our when it comes to fishing licenses for females. Also, we saw a huge increase in those numbers. Um, you know, you talk to some of the stores, you know, they're, they're selling out of a lot of equipment. Um, and, and, you know, that's, it's great to see because people are, I, I think, um, out and they're connecting with those resources. And in the UP, um, we have so many opportunities to do that. And so what a blessing to be, if you're going to be quarantining, the UP is the place to do it because you're, you're never going to be bored and you're not going to run out of anything to do. Um, so, you know, that's one bright spot in all of what we've uh, been through this past year is is you're just seeing a kind of back back to basics attention ice anglers young and old there's a fishing tournament coming up at the end of this month in curtis you don't want to miss frostbite pike contest this is our sixth annual one it's january 30th um you start signing up the wednesday before and you have until 9 a.m the day of the tournament for this first place is 500 dollars cash there's prizes out the fifth for this Registration is here at Mixed Bait. Uh, if you have any questions, you can call the shop at 906-586-6040, or you can also call the Curtis Chamber of Commerce at 906-586-3700. It's $25 for the adults to enter, $10 for the kids. It's on South Manistique, Big Manistique, North Manistique, Millicokia, and Millicokin Lakes. This is a fun thing that we do every year. Everybody just kind of goes out and has some fun. We've got our rules here and everything else, so we just want everybody to go have fun and be safe on the ice. Well, that's it for this week. 
Be sure to check out 906outdoors.com where you'll find the 906 Fishing Report, TV6 Weather, Shopping, and more. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering 906.